so today we're going to be talking about mistakes made in contracts so you know as a lawyer whether you're a lawyer watching this or a non-lawyer you know that drafting contracts is the one of the core responsibilities of every lawyer as a lawyer one day or not whether you are carving your niche in some other part of law or not you are going to be faced with the duty of drafting a contract and when you're drafting a contract there are certain mistakes you do not want to be ascribed to your name first they tell poorly of you they tell poorly of your of your practice in law and they just they just entirely give you a bad name and these things follow you someone tries someone is trying to draft a contract the person mentions your name somewhere and perhaps you made a mistake with a particular client someone such a person just discourages your potential client so while drafting contracts might seem easy because there are thousands of precedents you can look or you think you've gone through law school enough to know that these are certain things you should do there are certain things you still don't know especially if you're um, new to the practice of law so firstly uh, the number one mistake I made while while I was starting the first contract I did was to just use a particular sample the thing is the more samples you use the more your horizon is broadened the more you um, are exposed to different aspects of what a contract should look like if you just stick to one contract and draft according to that contract there are certain things you could perhaps have lifted from other contract sample agreements that would have been more beneficial to you than just sticking to one particular um, sample of contract. I'm not saying you should gather or gather as many contract samples as possible and try to implement everything into the particular contract you're drafting. Just look at as many contracts as possible. The next would be to remove assumptions from your dictionary. Ask your client as many questions as you can ask your client. Um, no matter how it may look, make you look silly. Oh, this contract, does, this lawyer doesn't know what he's doing. Ask questions till you are very sure that this is what your client is asking you to do. Do not assume that this is what is going to happen. Or this is not what you're going to. What is going to happen? Ask questions every step of the way. Ask questions as to how a particular instruction or obligation is to be carried out. Do not assume. Assumption has led to a lot of errors when drafting a contract so try and ask questions as much as you can do not be annoying when asking questions don't ask questions as someone that doesn't know what he's doing either but keep asking questions to just be sure you understand and you are carrying out the explanation of your client the next thing is to use and stick to the correct terms when drafting a contract if i'm drafting a contract for a software engineer it's not the same as drafting a contract for a civil engineer it's not the same as drafting a patient doctor agreement for a hospital use the correct terms google the correct terms if you don't know search your books read books that pertain to that particular profession you're drafting the contract for stick to those terms and use them correctly don't use doctor in the beginning and use health practitioner in the end because a health practitioner could be a pharmacist or a nurse or a med lab scientist stick to the terms you're already using and make sure you're using the correct terms too. the next would be to address the parties correctly are you dealing with an individual or a corporate body remember the way you um, introduce a party that is a company in a contract is not the same way you would introduce someone that is a business name know the difference this just makes you stand out and give your client confidence to keep coming back because you obviously know what you're doing next is not to forget the sanction clause or what I call the what if clause the thing is breaches are bound to have happen so the thing is what sanction would someone that who breaches a, a contract would have to face what contract what sanction will a someone who breaches an, a contract have to face if he does that the thing is always think of what if you're drafting a contract don't draft a contract like a child like with the pure and simple mind that a child would draft a contract with you have to be an adult and know that things don't always go as you plan so ask yourself for each step of the contract you draft in obligations of each of the parties ask yourself 
what if this person doesn't do this what if this person doesn't do that and you should always stipulate the sanctions he or she will face that is the party in the contract to face if he or she breaches the breaches the contract next will be the termination clause don't forget to add what and what constitutes termination of the particular contract per se it's an employment contract don't forget to state but not limit the particular things that will constitute termination of such an employment because the breaching party or wrong party can say that there are no grounds for so next is ADRs please don't forget to add alternative dispute resolutions it's even advised that lawyers should advise their clients to go through alternative dispute resolutions if, if, if you're just new in law per se in 100 level or younger years ADRs are alternative dispute resolutions in, in instead of instead of um, core litigation these are things like arbitration um, conciliation so you don't go through the process of having to apply to the court to pick either you're doing a mediation or arbitration or conciliation so the contract just speak for itself once there's a breach of contract once the parties don't feel things are going the way they hope it to be going they just go straight to the contract and ask themselves what is the stipulation of this are we going straight to litigation or what other ADR process we're going don't forget to add ADR process it's not only helpful and um, time saving the court will still send you back for an ADR process if you do not have and you don't want to be that lawyer that didn't add an ADR to this contract okay and next to be jurisdiction what jurisdiction will be guiding the agreement you cannot uh, you cannot um, draft a contract for uh, people in Abuja and be stipulating that the courts that would have jurisdiction over such an agreement to be won in Lagos you have to stipulate that the particular uh, jurisdiction or court that will be handling the particular contract in case of a breach is that particular place just don't forget that. okay so the next point to be to avoid last minute inclusions uh, you're about to print out the contract you're beginning to add uh, it, it just makes your it, it could make your contract really complicated because contract is so necessary that your words have to be explicit and understandable otherwise you might have to start going through the process of going to court to apply for um, originating summons for a particular contract to be explained or you might just mess up your contract so avoid last minute inclusions if you really have to include something at the last minute i advise you don't sign that contract that day be the person that didn't meet up to time or whatever but just don't sign that contract that day it's better to be safe than to be sorry uh, one of the mistakes i made uh, while drafting the contract uh, a contract was to uh, when i first started was not to add the first major the first major is a particular thing that can happen that can cause both parties or either of the parties to not be able to carry out the various uh, obligations that were ascribed to that a party for example this COVID-19 there was a total lockdown and if you don't add such a clause that is the first major clause I'm going to write it um, up here so you can see the spelling is called first major not majority first major so these are situations that likely would cause the obligation of a party to not be fulfilled so when you add the first major clause it just ordinarily states that if such a thing happens it doesn't amount to the breach of contract so long as the person duly informs the party that would be affected by his inobligation uh, his non-obligation that such a thing has happened so don't forget to ask the first major clause another thing is to know when you're crossing the line you might have the best interest of your client at heart but at the same time you are beginning to evade the natural simple important normal rights of the other party you might be trying to draft the contract for your own client and you're just so blinded by his or his or her own um, benefits of the contracts 
in you begin to cross lines you begin to scare the other clients away the other party away so know when you're crossing the line don't give too stringent things as much as you want your contract your client to benefit from the particular contract that you're drafting especially if it's in a very um, technical position things that have to do with intellectual property and all it is best to um, not go over the line don't try don't be extremely stringent I made this mistake there's this software developer I, I created an agreement for and I, I, I drafted an NDA clause and um, I was to show it to the parties because I didn't want them to steal these ideas normally it's going to sound like I was doing the right thing but luckily for me I called a lawyer that specializes in a, a colleague of mine that specializes in the whole IP thing and I sought his advice about the NDA for those that don't know NDAs if you're just starting no judgment you per se you're just fresh from secondary school or however you're watching whoever it is that is watching the video an NDA clause is a non-disclosure agreement it's an agreement that binds two parties that sign it to the extent that they shall not give details of the particular um, thing that happened between two of them in a particular place or in a particular contract they shouldn't give details of such a particular circumstance or incident or information to other persons that are not parties to that particular contract non-disclosure agreement so that you don't disclose um, issues or circumstances involving a particular contract or whatever to other parties that are not part of that particular contract it's just for intellectual property um, protection so that people don't use information that you're giving to them to their own, to your own detriment and to their own gain so know when you're crossing the line don't over appease your client just be fair and don't cross the line <laughs> okay and uh, next is not to forget to add your illiterate jurat or your blind jurat the illiterate jurat if you're just starting law as a law student uh, uh, an illiterate jurat is like the section of a contract that you put to state that a person that is uh, a party one of the core parties that is either of the parties of the particular contract that are about to sign the agreement do not understand the contents of the agreement and so the agreement was read to the person that does not understand the contents of, of the agreement by someone and so the person read it to the person in the language the person can understand and the person appended his signature and then wrote his name and his address so um that is for an illiterate jurat illiterate jurat doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't go to school or you don't understand basic things it just sometimes just means you do not understand the language in which the particular contract was written in so um don't forget to add the illiterate jurat if your client do not does not understand the language the contract you're drafting in is you can like you can have international clients from other countries that just don't understand english so you need to put the illiterate jurat that states that they the contract was read to such a foreign person and the language that he or she understood and then there's a blind jurat for those that are just coming into law my little colleagues my upcoming colleagues in law on the level at the graduate level so the blind jurat is the um section of the contract just like the illiterate jurat that states that such a person that has entered a contract with the other party is blind and so that the the, the contract has been read to the person honestly in the language or uh, he, he has understand and that he or she has affixed their tongue print so if your client is blind or either of the parties are blind or do not understand english or are illiterate don't forget to add illiterate jurat and the blind jurat and um lastly i made this mistake but i corrected don't forget to add your stamp and seal please i beg you as a lawyer you've been called to bar add your stamp and seal it is very important it is cited in law actually that a, a 
particular process filed or contract letter whatever it is that has been written by a lawyer will not be recognized by just his mere signature his stamp and seal should be uh, his stamp and seal should be affixed to such a contract so your stamp and seal should be affixed to the contract when you affix it towards the part where your name is and where you sign it's best to actually sign over your um, stamp and seal for safety purposes because there are all sorts of scams and things happening in nigeria at the moment or all around the world so append your signature across your stamp and seal for safety um, safety purposes so um, okay. concerning stamp and seal there's this case i'm going to read it out from my phone it's today's cars limited versus lasako assurance plc and others is a 2016 case in nigeria that states that a lawyer who makes payment for his seal and stamp can affix the receipt evidencing payment made in that regard to the document in the obscene of the stamp and seal because things take time uh, especially in this covid 19 era before i got my stamp and seal it took quite a, a, a good number of times i wouldn't have taken on a normal day so in that situation or where your stamp and seal has expired and you really need to affix your stamp and seal to a particular contract or document or whatever it is you can affix the receipts of your stamp and seal that you've paid for the up the new coming one that you're about to get you can affix um, a receipt of that that will suffice for your stamp and seal that you may or may not have gotten and remember that you can use your on your expired uh, because likely you're going to be getting uh, when you get your stamp and seal it has a life duration usually expires the match of the following year so remember that there are certain processes you cannot affix um, um, expired stamp and seal on that this particular stamp and seal subject will be something i'm going to discuss in another video altogether we're going to be going really really deep into that and uh, <laughs> all right so i really hope you enjoyed this video if you got to this point thank you so much for getting to this point please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and share this video to who you know is going to be important to remember if you forget any step you can always come back and view and uh, <laughs> i just hope you learned a lot from my video till next time i hope you always come back because not that you get knowledge until it's okay all right thank you so much for getting to this and staying with yeah getting to this point and staying with me please just don't forget to subscribe and share to people you know this video will be beneficial so till the next time we see take care of yourself and bye